Okay, welcome everyone. This is Jonathan Lipp from the Big Apple Film Festival. I want to thank you all for being here today. Uh, this week, we present the Big Apple Film Festival Fall Edition. So we're so excited. We have New York City premieres of some great feature films, feature documentaries, short films, episodic content, animation, student films, and more. So um, check out BigAppleFilmFestival.com for the complete list of films and programs. Uh, and as part of this year's festival, we are presenting a distribution summit. And the purpose of this is primarily for filmmakers to um, receive insight and strategies from distributors and sales agents uh, on the best strategies to go about um, uh, getting the most exposure for your film, getting it out to the public, distribution, um, festivals, uh, distribution strategies, and so forth. So uh, for our first conference today, um, this this uh, conference is titled, titled uh, Licensing Your Film to Streaming Networks. Um, so we're going to focus primarily on a conversation regarding streaming networks, which seems to be the, um, the, uh, uh, the trends, especially uh, within, the last, within the last couple of years, even more, more so than ever. Um, so we have with us uh, Lee Avery Peck, who is the Manager of Content Acquisitions at 1091 Pictures. We have Jeff Porter, who is the President of Porter Pictures. And we have sales agent Ken Dubo. So uh, I want to thank you all for being here. And um, I want to first just start quickly by asking each of you if you could um, just tell us a bit about yourself and your background. So um, why don't we um, start with with Lev? Yeah. Hey guys. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I work on the content acquisitions team at 1091. Um, so you know, focused on finding the projects that we're going to put out and uh, sell. Um, I was part of 1091 when we were the Orchard. Um, I've gone through, you know, the progression of work on the release management team, uh, strategy team, and, and pretty much a little bit of everything at the company. Thank you, Lev. Uh, let's go over to Jeff. Jeff is from uh, Porter Pictures. Jeff Porter, how are you? No, how are you doing? Thank you for, for the invitation. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Jeff Porter, a founder of Porter Pictures. Um, I have formed Porter Pictures a little over a decade ago to help and assist filmmakers, you know, in, in, in finding the best distribution for their films. At this point, I've acquired and sold well over 100 plus films around the world. We've done deals, you know, in the U.S. with pretty much most of the television networks, of course, you know, from the Netflixes, HBO, Showtimes, Hulu's, you name it. Um, we've sold films internationally for well over a decade as well. So the goal is, you know, finding good films, helping filmmakers, you know, get the best distribution deal for their films and, and getting the best return. Okay, thank you, Jeff. And let's move over to Ken. Ken is a sales agent. So Ken, uh, if you want to tell us a bit about your background. Uh, my background is long. <laughs> so I'm not going to be short. Um, I started in this business in syndication, U.S. syndication way back in 1980, and eventually was brought to Cannes and discovered, discovered Cannes instead of never going back to Cincinnati to renew Regis and Kathy Lee again. And um, Access Entertainment is my own company. Um, been around a few years. I'd rather work for myself. I work with all sorts of movies and TV programs. All right, thank you very much. So I'm gonna ask um, all the participants uh, any questions you have or information on your projects that you'd like to share and ask a question about, um, please feel free to go ahead and put it into the uh, the Q&A box or the chat box here, and uh, we'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, and as you're doing that, let me start with a couple of questions of my own. Um, so let me start with Lev. Uh, in terms of royalties uh, for filmmakers and producers, um, what type of, uh, in, in looking at like the streaming networks, what are the different models um, in terms of royalties, we have AVOD, SVOD, TVOD, in case anyone's not familiar, if you could just speak about that briefly. Yeah, um, so I mean, the two two big ones you mentioned are AVOD and SVOD. Uh, SVOD, you know, you're, you're getting a, uh, a license fee, a fat fee from, you know, a Hulu and HBO and Netflix, um, any of those, uh, and those are generally paid out, um, you know, either quarterly over the whole course of the, the life and even actually beyond a bit of the life that, you know, say a Hulu might have the film um, or, you know, it's paid in a lump depending on what the deal is. Um, AVOD is all uh, ad, ad supported, ad based. Um, and so your revenue is generated on, you know, minutes watched or, or ad. Um, Amazon had a model Prime Video Direct, which was also, you know, a minutes watch page which falls under SVOD, but it's sort of like an AVOD uh, part of things. Um, and 
So that's generally ad based revenue and occasionally they'll, they'll pay out a, a flat fee for that, but generally it's all just uh, how it's, uh, you know, how many minutes watched it's had on that platform. Um, and then you kind of have, you know, the normal rent or own uh, those revenue streams as well, EST and TVOD. Um, those are sort of the, all the four biggest ones. Great. Thank you. And, and Jeff, from your experience with the films that you've released, do, do you find that one of those models uh, overall has provided better royalties to filmmakers? Have you found AVOD works better, SVOD, anything, Jeff, from your experience? Honestly, I think that's a tricky answer a bit, you know, because it really depends on the film. I've had certain films where, of course, the licensing deal that we've received from the, the SVOD partner that we've worked with, you know, is very substantial. Typically, the SVOD partner we work with asks to take AVOD, so it's like a fight and a hustle trying to withhold AVOD. Um, but, you know, depending on the company that you're working with, they'll typically, they're primarily ask for AVOD rights as well. But I've had films where I've sold um, licensing deals t uh, for SVOD, and then I've done a separate deal for AVOD, and the AVOD numbers were better over time. Um, now they're growing a lot more than they have, being that a lot more advertisers are going towards more AVOD platforms than they had in the past. So we're seeing a lot more, um, you know, presence there and a lot more turnover in regards of profits coming from the AVOD platform than we have in the past. But primarily, a, you know, a few years back, TVOD, I mean, SVOD was well over in regards to what you're going to receive on the AVOD platform. But we're starting to see a big jump in numbers on the free platforms, you know, with the 2B services and et cetera out there. So would you say that AVOD then generally does better in the long term? Well, yes, in regards, if you've got a film that's getting a lot of views, meaning, you know, SVOD, you're getting a licensing deal and it's pretty much up once, you know, you have a term set. So two, three years, whatever the, the term is for your, for your SVOD deal. Um, and that's pretty much all the money you're going to get unless, you know, you have a separate deal with that partner where, you know, if you reach a certain threshold, but typically it's just a licensing deal, you know, hey, you get a certain amount for a, a time period, whereas the AVOD, you know, it's just like, you know, the, the amount of viewers that are actually watching your content and the amount of ads that are being uh, displayed during that time, you're seeing revenue from each one of those. So if those numbers are, are substantial, you're going to see a, a better return on AVOD, but then it's really about, you know, making sure the viewers are there to kind of view your content and the content provider you're working with has a good amount of ad share revenue coming through uh, their platform as well. All right. Thank you. And um, so Ken, uh, as a sales agent, um, let me ask you um, if you could just speak a bit about what the, the role of a sales engine, the role of a sales agent is and how it sort of benefits filmmakers and producers. Um. Uh, a sales agent's a little bit like a real estate agent. You got a house, you need to sell the house. You're not quite an expert on selling the house. So you need somebody who understands, has the connections, um, exhibits at the markets. Um, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult for producers to go out and try to be their own sales agent. Most, most don't, because you have to, you learn from experience. So you're, you're going out and you're trying to do this thing and um, you don't have any experience at it. Most probably you're going to fail or you're not, you're not going to do well with it um, because in this business um, and especially in the, in, you know, since the pandemic um, buyers who don't want your movie skip on by, you know, they just don't, they don't even, they don't even say hello. So you, 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 Without markets, you miss the running into somebody thing. And um, markets are, I, I really believe, a um, an experience thing. You've got to you've got to have been doing a lot of them to understand them and to have the connections to make them to make them work. You only have a limited number of days. Hopefully, we're all going to get back together in Berlin in February. Yeah, I truly miss that, Ken. I tell you. Oh, I miss it too, Jeff. Oh, big time. <laughs> this is the longest I've been off the road my entire life. I'm like, part of everyone. <laughs> so, uh, real quick, I just want to, um, in the chat box, Jermaine, I think, missed um, the SVOD and ABOD. He asked about the, the, the differences. Um, uh, SVOD is subscription based, where the revenue comes in through uh, subscribers, and uh, AVOD is advertisement um, based. Um, yeah, I just want to, I, yeah, I just want to confirm that. And um, all right, so let me just go over to a couple of questions. We have some questions in the Q and A box, some questions in the chat box. 
Um, let's just start, let's start in the chat box with Arlette. Um, what is the best model for independent filmmakers um, to get for their films? So maybe we'll start with Lev. You want to just, uh, we'll just get a sort of quick answer. Yeah. 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 I think sort of similar to what Jeff said, it, it really depends on the film. Um, you know, a lot of our films, we run through the normal sort of, you know, system of going, you know, transactional, you know, you, you go up for rent or own on iTunes, Amazon, all, all the main digital platforms. Um, and that's generally a, uh, you know, three month, 90 day window on there. You know, we go to cable as well. Um, and then, you know, then you sort of look at what your opportunities are on the SVOD streaming side, you know, if you can get uh, an exclusive license deal out of Hulu or, or an HBO or a Netflix, or if, you know, you're looking at non-exclusive opportunities and that all, or, or straight to AVOD, and that all depends on the film. Um, you know, a film with less cast, but, you know, is an action film with, you know, really good artwork and really good trailer, you know, you might go 45 or 30 days transactional and then go right to an AVOD platform. So it really varies based on what the film is, um, you know, cast driven film, you, know, you definitely want to go kind of the, the full, the full cycle and, and do transactional for 90 days and see what your opportunities are. And then look at, you know, if you're going to go to, you know, get a, a license deal from Hulu or, or go to you know, the Tubi right away, you know, it, it just depends on what the film is. Um, you know, so we, we sort of look at each one and, and see what we think will, will be the best way to do it. How about you, Jeff? What do you think is the best model nowadays for indie filmmakers? No, no, no. With that, um, it's very hard to grasp unless you have the exact idea of the film that you're working with. But the ideal model, um, you know, for let's say the best case scenario for our films would be, of course, a limited theatrical um, in the States and, and, and somewhere abroad, depending where the film works best at internationally. And then, of course, you know, the goal after that is to, to, to look for a broadcast deal. So a licensing deal with a broadcast network, you know, in the States and internationally, just the same. And then after that, I prefer to go with the transactional market as soon as my blackout period with broadcast, because I've learned typically if I go directly to SVOD, now mind you, um, it's a case by case scenario, but I've learned typically if we sell to Netflix, you know, before television or before uh, uh, and transactional, which is your iTunes, your Google Play, your typical, you know, $3.99, $5.99 purchases, we lose a lot of revenue on the transactional side because so many people have those uh, platforms that they're subscribing to. And so, yes, we secured a licensing deal, but I prefer to wait a little bit longer and get a lesser of a licensing deal if it's still applicable after we've done on transactional markets. That way, the people that, you know, don't, that have Netflix, but then still want to see the film would still go pay the $2.99, $3.99, wherever the transactional fee is at the platform they're working with. And then, of course, go to SVOD and then AVOD. Um, that's the ideal way. But the problem is a lot of companies try to prevent you from going that way, you know. They'll put bids in. They want, you know, the film first, depending on the type of film it is. But ideally, you know, that's what we try to do. You know, the theatrical broadcast, um, transactional, SVOD, AVOD, and the same thing um, internationally as long as we can. But internationally is a little bit different because you're working with a lot of different companies in those territories that are handling that same thing for you. But that's the ideal way for me. Okay, thank you. And um, for Ken, um, I'm going to sort of combine two questions here. Arlette and uh, Jesse are asking about sales agents. Uh, Arlette's question is, is it best to deal with a sales agent or work directly with distributors? And Jesse wants to know the best way to connect with sales agents. Well, most, distri most distributors or broadcasters, if you're a producer, because they don't accept unsolicited material, they're just going to ignore you. They're going to walk on by, as I said. Um, it, it's just, they don't want to be accused of, of taking unsolicited material. It's just, it's very, it's very difficult. You really do need a sales agent. Um, and a lot of times as a sales agent these days, I do take people through all the, either I sell the film off to, to another distributor, say here in the United States, but I'm still working with the producer and the distributor through the different windows and making sure that we're, we're maximizing everything. Um, like Lev and Jeff has said, not every movie is sort of different. They, they're like little snowflakes, if you will. And um, so what you're going to do for them with distribution is just depends upon the film and what's the best way you can, you can get money out of it. You can get revenue out of it. The one thing I would say is, and, and it's just going to make a few filmmakers faint out there. Don't make a movie without it being paid for. Um, it, it's a good way to lose money. It's especially in today's marketplace. It's really the, the only movies I, I do take on um, 
what you call movies that are made that 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 I think are special, but most of what I sell, whether it is for for film or for broadcast, because I do a lot of Lifetime and Hallmark type movies, also um, they're pre-sold. You wouldn't make a TV show without it being commissioned. Don't make a movie without without having some money in the bank. So uh, those type of uh, films, Hallmark, Lifetime, those are very often pre-sold um, prior to like they have to be. They you, 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 you have lifetime can they, they're made here in the US mostly as SAG modified low budgets. I mean, we, we shoot them here in LA for like 300 grand now. Mm-hmm. And um, they can't have distribution before, before they're made because they're SAG modified low budgets. Uh, but lifetime gives you a little nod and wink on the um, thing. I've had some lifetime producers who have moved over to, um, Netflix now, and instead of making movies for 300 grand, they're making them for 5 million. So <laughs> if you want some more yeah. money, don't go, don't go to the free broadcasters, go to, go to like Netflix. Yeah. They didn't know what the, one set of producers didn't know what to do with the money. They, they shot a, they were shooting a Christmas movie and they shot it um, guerrilla style. They shot a scene a, without getting permits in New York city and Netflix went crazy on them. So don't ever do that again. You, <laughs> you have enough money to get all the permits you need. <laughs> so it just, and it makes movies different. They're different, they're, they're different math. Netflix is buying that $5 million movie for the world. You're not, you're not going to have any rights. They're going to hold on to it forever. Whereas these $300,000 lifetime or, or, or uh, movies, Hallmark's a little different. The, the lifetime movies, they're buying only the United States. You have the rest of the world to sell. There are certain territories that that they they sell in, um, and you make good money because the free broadcasters use them there. So it's it's a they're different sort of movies for different sort of things. The Lifetime movie in terms of revenue is only going to go here, where you could make a a Blair Witch project for fifty grand, and it could go, you know, it could go through the ceiling. So you just don't know. And um, Al, Al was asking about standard licensing agreements. Um, he, they're 50-50. I don't know, Lev, do you want to speak to that, the, uh, standard licensing agreements? Uh, it, it's like thing with the, with the partners, I imagine. I, I think it varies. I don't have a ton of insight up to that side, to be honest. That's mostly our sales team that deals with those agreements. Um, but I, I, from what I know, I think it is usually like that. I don't know if, Jeff or Ken, you guys have a better sense. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do, the percentages are really dependent. I'd love 50-50 on everything. It doesn't happen. Um, sales agents generally depend, but depending on a budget of a movie, I've worked for as low as 2.5% for a really high budget movie, and I've worked as high as 50%. So it generally 20%, 15 to 20%, but sales agents take what are called market fees, which are, are single payments that come out of revenue which are help offset other costs of, of the markets and, and things. And, and because you can't really, when you're accounting for expenses, you can't account across all your movies. So you take a market fee and that accounts for some of the expenses. Um, but I, I take a single fee, a market fee. I, I recoup my direct expenses is related to the movie, which is like the screenings, um, advertising, marketing, you know, about the great flyers, things like that. And, and that's it. And then the rest goes back to the producer. So, yeah. And, and also like, okay, so let's look at an example of like a licensing deal. So Jeff, let, let me ask you like, um, for example, let's look at a film like Santa Girl, right? So you had, uh, it was released on Netflix, NBC, uh, the NBC Peacock Network. So like, how does a deal like that work? Are you, um, you know, is it being, is, is the revenue being divided up between yourself and, and as the distributor and then all the other streaming platforms? Like how, how does that model work? Obviously, you know, without using specific numbers, but I'm just wondering like the, the model or something like that. No, no, with, uh, of course, of course. So typically a licensing deal. So for example, if Netflix or Hulu or, you know, HBO Max or any other SBOD platform. And SBOD, as you, as you said, is subscription-based. So meaning, you know, everyone out there, any platform that you're paying a monthly subscription to, so the $12.99, $90.99, $5.99, whatever your, the payments are, um, they typically play a licensing deal. So that would be an outright, you know, hey, we're going to cut you a check for X and X amount of dollars. You know, it could be anywhere, you know, 
15, 20 grand to, to a half a million dollars to a million bucks, you know, in regards of a licensing deal for a certain period of time, meaning they have exclusive rights on that platform to license your deal or non-exclusive, depending on the type of deal, but you're going to get less money in a non-exclusive, but on an exclusive way. So for example, we, we use Netflix uh, so often now. So let's say Netflix will offer, you know, 50 K and I'm just using a random number just guys. So it's not, you know, anything particular, but Netflix will offer 50 K and they'll say, Hey, we want this film for the next two years. Um, and so meaning that film is on that platform for the next two years and you receive only 50 K for that licensing deal for it to be on that platform. You're not receiving any extra revenues based on performance, how it does, when it does. I'm sure there's negotiables somewhere in there, but you know, I'm not too experienced on a negotiating past a licensing deal on a performance based situation with F bot partners. You know, I believe some studios have that access. Um, and that privilege, but for the most part, you're going to get a licensing deal for the next two years, and that's all the money you're going to see. Whereas, you know, um, well, Peacock is, is similar as well. Um, so those are typically licensing deals. The only platforms where you're going to see residual revenues in regards of quarterly payments are from your your pay um, pay platforms, meaning you're actually going to pay to purchase and watch this film, or you're renting the film, or you're buying the film um, outright. And those you're going to see transactional. Um, and you'll see quarterly returns, but typically if it's on any platform that's a subscription based or a broadcast network that you're watching for free on TV of some sort, it's usually a licensing deal that they paid outright and you receive the check and then they have access to, to premiere that film or to broadcast that film for a lot amount of time. All right, thanks. And, and Ben asked, um, uh, do sales agents accept unsolicited films? Um, would you take a look at a film from a filmmaker who maybe doesn't have an agent at the moment? Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Ken, yeah, yeah. Do you, 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 cut, you cut out for a second. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Everyone froze. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. It's, see, yeah. we need in-person guys. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. I do look at unsolicited films, um, but they really have to appeal to me on a commercial basis. And I'm very honest with producers about my ability to get their money back or not. Um you know, it just, it, it, it's, it's film dependent, but I do get, I do get unsolicited things. Sometimes, sometimes I come across great projects. I would say two, three percent of the time, most of it, um, it, it's not, it's not something I'm really looking for. And I do, I do everything. Like I said, the, 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 those type of movies, I also do documentaries. Um, I'm doing, I'm doing a couple documentaries right now. I do foreign films. I have um, I have a Lithuanian film right now that's that's going to be in Tivad starting February. Um, that was it's the Lithuanian. I have two Academy Award nominations from other countries: the one from Brazil and the one from Lithuania. Not big countries, but they're they're very unique films, and they they will have um, an audience here in the United States, and they'll sell in like four or five territories around the other the other parts of the world. All right. Uh, there was a question. I'm just going over to the Q&A box. Um, Stephanie asked about distribution while a film is still in development prior to the film being completed. Uh, do distributors work with filmmakers at all, you know, before the film's even done or will you even interact with a filmmaker yet? Um, Lev, what, would 1091 Pictures speak to a filmmaker who's only in production or development? It's working. I think it's frozen. Love you there. Yeah, it just came okay. back and everything's set up. I think I got it though. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think my so connection film, is unstable. It's telling me. Yeah, <laughs> films that are in development, in production, would yeah. you network with a filmmaker at that point? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we'll we'll start talking. Um, you know, we currently are not doing deals at that stage. You know, we're we're starting to think about them and considering them just based on you know where the market currently is. Um, but for us to, you know, do a deal, you know, a backstop deal or pre-buy deal, you know, before the film is made or while the film is being made, um, you know, it, it needs to have a lot of, it needs to check a lot of boxes, you know, have the right cast, have kind of a known director. Um, it just has a lot for us to, you know, especially give up a little bit of money before we even have a project, you know, something can look really, really, really good on paper, but then, you know, you know might just not translate um so you know it's it's something you know we're always happy to talk to people and see what there is um but for us it just has to check those boxes you know for for pre-buy or, or backstop scenario 
Um, but we'll, we're always happy to talk and, and hear what's in the pipeline and, and, and track projects. Um, you know, just seeing what's in the work is, is always good. Right. I was going to say it's probably on an individual basis, right? Like, an, you know, each film. Yeah. If a filmmaker has acquired the rights to a New York Times bestselling book, even prior sure. to being made, maybe you'd speak to them. Where if you know, you know, Brad Pitt is attached to it or something, <laughs> of course, yeah. in way, of course, you're going to, it all depends yeah. on the situation. If, um, if Brad Pitt's attached, we'll, we're, we're on board for, for <laughs> sure. Um, but, but I mean, even, even things are being filmed, you know, if, if there are dailies to look at, you know, that's something we can look at, you know, a sizzle reel that, that always helps. Um, but yeah, you know, we, we need some, some substantial, something we know will work. Right. Um, and Jeff, I would say pre-sales pre are, are harder and harder to, to these days. Um, really the 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 distributors internationally have been mauled by the pandemic um so much of their revenue is dependent upon theatrical because either they own the theaters in their home country or they no oh, i think it froze is he there can you there i think it's can i think you're muted how about now Um, Ken, I think you're muted there. All right, look. All right, let me jump over. Oh, there oh, okay. I'm sorry. It, it, I lost you all together and it came back up all muted. Um, what I was saying is pre-sales are really a bear right now. Um, they just, the distributors internationally have been, have been hurt tremendously by the pandemic. A lot of their business um, is theatrical because either they own the theaters or they just don't have the maturity of the, the networks that we have here to do for, for back stuff on TV and TVOD and stuff like that. Um, and so you're right, Lev, if you got if you got Brad Pitt or something, something like that, then you you have a movie, but then you have to get it shot. I had a a Mads Micklin film that was supposed to go in Thailand about Vikings who go down the coast of Africa. Um, a great scene where they they have a, a fight with gorillas in Africa um, because I've never seen them before. And um, they can't get to Northern Thailand, you can't shoot. So I have distributors who are interested in the movie, but if you can't shoot the movie, then you're, you're kind of stuck. And that's, yeah. and so what, what I'm seeing is AFM um, or IFTA every week puts out um, puts out what's in production, what's being offered by the sales companies. Boy, I'm seeing a lot of crap. Yes. A lot of bad, bad movies. No offense, guys, but a lot of a lot of a lot of stuff that just doesn't have commercial value, and that is that is really it's 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 a sign of just the times. I mean, I've, I've, I have, I've internalized. I started YouTube channels up on Voodoo, Roku. Um, I've got over a hundred thousand YouTube subscribers right now um, with, with my libraries. Um, I'm on distro. I'm on all the platforms, everything. That's how I'm making money because I have no films that outside the lifetime films, which we can still shoot here in LA. So yep. that's a long answer to your question about, you know, unsolicited materials. So uh, I've actually yeah. seen the market uh, fluctuate quite a bit, you know, in, in that regard, in regards of what pre-sales used to be compared to them being now. I mean, back in the day, you know, you could sell a good film, you could have the same production team, you know, a similar cast or director and a distribution company or network would automatically, just because of what you did with your previous film, put an offer in and, and, and give you something up front for your next film coming in. Whereas now, you know, they just stopped having to. It's kind of like, hey, we can wait now. We can afford to wait until the film is done and then take a gander at it that, at that point. And now, of course, they know they might have to bid a little bit more because of now the film is done. You have more, you know, competition in, in, in the wheelhouse. But distributors have been a lot more spoiled. Now, with the whole pandemic happening, the market went from oversaturated to completely undersaturated. And so I think that's what Ken is speaking on in regards of your, the quality of films have changed dramatically. Um, and also the international market, you got to understand back in the day, they had different options of purchasing films, whereas now they're spoiled. They have a boatload of content themselves. You know, um, the same way we have these viewing platforms of Netflix's and different SWOT platforms, they have as well, but then they have 
you know, tons of titles where I've seen, you know, before internationally, they would work with a subpar type title and still pay you decent monies. Whereas now, you know, hey, we need we need upper echelon. We need the same thing you're selling in the U.S. the same way. You know, we don't want anything past two years old. You know, we need a heck of a cover and, 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 and a great trailer and something that we can actually really work with. And we're seeing that big change now from that market as well, which is which changes pre-sales tremendously. And, and it changes the opportunity of films being able to be sold. Um, before they've been created because just based on the market being you know people are spoiled now it's like hey we don't have to buy your film now at this stage we can wait till it's completed or if you have a great relationship you know you might be able to get something there if they trust you and they have an understanding what the production is going to be like but even still with those relationships you know i've been told hey we'll just wait and they'll they'll string you along and and you have a cut now for us to see and they'll wait till you have something for them to show you before they actually put a solid offer up where you can get the money Right. Um, and Ken had mentioned um, commercial value that he's seeing films that necessarily do not, don't, don't necessarily have commercial value. Um, Lev, for, from as a distributor, how do you define commercial value? Like uh, Leylin and Robert here asked, you know, what, what do you define? What is commercial value to a distributor, for example? Yeah, I think what we see sort of be the most important thing is, is straight up just cast. Um, it's, it's, it's a no name. It's someone recognizable. Um, you know, whether that's the name or the face, you know, I think we've said a few times, you know, creatives are also super important alongside a cast. So, you know, being able to have uh, a creative that's going to stand out on your storefront and, and be flashy and, and people will want to click on it. Um, you know, when we have films that don't necessarily have cast, we don't feel that uh, having the star who no one really knows their face on the art move the needle at all. So having that cast member to, to put their face and then people see that. Um, you know, that's what makes them click on the art because it's, you know, it's a good art and it has a, a face that they know. Um, and, and that's pretty much what can really get you there. Um, and then just a, a topic that people are interested in. Um, I think a lot of what we see in audiences is, is sort of middle America and, and appealing to them. So, you know, action films, crime films, I mean, Westerns are things that we're seeing being requested from partners. Um, I think those are sort of the, the, the mainstream genres that, that people that we see are doing the best across your know, transactional AVOD and streaming. Right. And, and, and Lev also, um, um, so, uh, in the Q, I'm just in the Q and A box. Uh, so Elijah had asked, um, at what stage, um, do you as a distributor usually pick up a project? So Lev, first start with you, where, what stage would you? Yeah. Um, we, we pick it up at many different stages. I mean, obviously, like, like I said earlier, you know, we need to cut, you know, we need something to see. So it doesn't necessarily have to be finished, but it has to be close to being finished. You know, we don't necessarily want a film that we then have to wait six months to get the final cut. You know, we pick up a film, you know, we want to get it out, you know, in the next, you know, three, three to five months from signing. Um, so, you know, generally it's either before they hit their festival run and, you know, we can help with some small festivals and, and get them some places or it's, you know, while they're amidst their festival run um, is generally when we're, we're looking to pick up films. Okay. And Jeff, what about, what about for Porter pictures? When do you usually approach a filmmaker? I'm it's on mute. I, I think it's, yeah. There Sorry about that. No, I, um, of course, you know, on, on my end as a distributor sales agent, you want to find a film at the earliest stage possible. You want to have the most amount of influence from the, from the very beginning. Um, the downside is there could be so many factors that take place from the very beginning to the finish end project, you know, and so if you're not involved, you know, on set a lot or, or, or watching, you know, how things are being shot, you, based on what you're hoping to get to compare to what you truly get can be, you know, a vast of a difference. But the goal is to, to get as early a stage as possible where we can actually take something out and sell it. So a rough cut, um, you know, a trailer, um, something that you have that can actually show me what the production is looking like um, that I can actually take to a buyer and get them an idea of what the film is going to be um, and how it's going to appear. So, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to answer exactly, but the earliest stage is possible on my side. And Jeff, for, for Porter Pictures, how do you define commercial value as well, uh, in addition to name talent, like? Lev just mentioned, I'm sure that's a part of it. Anything else that you would look at? Honestly, I think the best analogy is what Ken, you know, put on the table in regards of film being like real estate. You know, if, if you understand anything about real estate and about houses, you know, film is almost identical, you know, in regards of the type of house you're looking to be built, the, the value of these houses, you know, um, 
in regards of your house is going to have, you know, granite countertops, et cetera, you know, granite being compared to actors and cast. And of course the outside shell meaning production value and, 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 and team, the way the film overall looks and then all the amenities inside. So, um, of course I would love an ideal cast of Tom Cruise, you know, someone that's going to be equitable from the very, very beginning, you put them on the cover and automatically, you know, your film's a million dollar film. Um, a director is, is, is vastly important. You know, I've learned, you know, cinematographers, DPs add a lot of value to a project. I mean, even though their name might not be as, as, as equitable as like a, a main cast member, what they bring to the production is amazing uh, at times. So, you know, you, you start off from production value of what looks visually appealing. And then, of course, you go to performances and cast. Even if it's a, not a known cast, but they gave me an amazing performance, sometimes that can resonate as well. As long as you have someone that they can, you know, name they can kind of, kind of tie into. And then, of course, you know, um, the storyline, what the, the genre of the film is about as well, because that, that matters a lot, you know, compared to if you just have a talking head film like a drama, where it's very, very cast heavy, or if you have an action film that is actually shot very well, where someone's not really, you know, needing Tom Cruise to kind of play this action lead star, but then the star that you have is playing a great role because the story flows and, and, and the genre sells. Same thing goes for horror. A lot of times, you know, you have these zombie films and, and, and different types of films that, that, that fall in the horror category that do extremely well without named stars just based on the type of film it is and, and, and how the film was portrayed and how the film was shot. So, you know, a commercial can, can stretch across the way in regards of, you know, high level and, and mid level. But I think the biggest thing, of course, you, you focus on initially is the uh, amazing production value, a great performance from your cast, and the end piece being, you know, something that I can watch all the way through and be impressed by where I'm not even concerned if I didn't have Tom Cruise attached to the film, you know, um, where that wasn't even in my thought process. And so if I can watch a film and, and, and I'm not concerned in thinking about who the cast is because it's just a really good film, I think that resonates and, and adds so much commercial value. Um, whereas, you know, if you don't have the money, that's what you focus on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, actually, a few people had asked about um, how to contact you or to send the uh, information perhaps to your companies um, uh, after this conference. So we'll, we'll get to we'll get to that at the end. Uh, but I wanted to just um, in terms of commercial value, I know we're talking about casts and things like that. Um, what about the documentary space? Um, like someone had asked about the marketplace for documentaries in the foreign market. Um, and perhaps even in the domestic market. Um, so Ken, as a sales agent, what do you see happening in the documentary uh, marketplace? Um, documentaries here in the United States are, are have found more value because there's so many streamers that are now running them. Um, and so you, you have found value with it. It's not quite the same overseas. Again, lack of streamers, um, a lot of documentaries have to do with just U.S. subjects, and that doesn't have appeal. Um, you, need, you need something that has a wide appeal to an audience um, for, for a documentary and to, or to a niche that you know you can take advantage of. Um, but you can't expect a ton of revenue. The numbers are really way different for documentaries than they are for fic fictional narrative films. Huh. Thanks. And so there was a question about the role that film festivals play in finding a distributor. Um, but I just want to add, add, add to that question. Uh, so I would say easily more than 99% of filmmakers are not going to get into the top tier festivals, right? Like Sundance, Toronto, et cetera. Um, not necessarily because they don't have great films, just because of the competition that's involved, right? Um, so my question is, how can... How, first, the, the, question, the question was, how do film festivals play a role in distribution? But my question as well is, how do film festivals that are not necessarily top tier film festivals uh, help filmmakers secure distribution or get exposure for their films? So let me start with Liv. Yeah, uh, I mean, we, you know, obviously we look at all the biggest ones, but we, we track all the smaller festivals as well. Um, you know, going through lineups, just just seeing what's what they're ha what they have. You know, when you see a film at many different festivals, you know, that's a good sign. I mean, a lot of it's building your audience. You know, just getting you know, if you're on a sort of nationwide tour of festivals and and you you've, you've really built an audience through through all those festivals, that's that's a good sign. You know, building a social following, um, something we look at as well. You know, people like it. You know, that's a good sign. Um, but you know, from the biggest ones to the smallest ones, you know, we're we're looking at all the lineups to see what's out there and. 
uh, whether, you know, we're actually attending or just sort of, you know, taking names and then going to find contacts and seeing what's going on after, you know, we see the reception. Um, we're, we're still looking at every festival um, from, from big to small. Cool. Thanks. And how about you, Jeff? Do you um, look at all the festivals? Uh, how does it, how does that work? Oh, uh, well, first thing I want to touch base on the documentary side that Ken, you know, spoke on, you know, I actually love documentary films, you know, just to kind of add that, that, that in there, just because, Hey, I've, I've done some amazing sales with docs, you know, especially with different broadcast networks domestically and internationally. I found docs to be timeless in regards to, you can relicense docs depending on the subject matter of the docs over and over again. Um, and, you know, networks consistently will pay a licensing fee depending on what the doc is about and the timing that's come in. So, you know, I've found, I've had some great success with documentary films. Now I've also, you know, seen a lot of struggle with certain docs as well. You know, character driven docs are very tough sales. You know, certain documentaries are just hard, hard to sell depending on what the doc is about. But I've seen certain docs that just transcend and they do extremely well. Sometimes they do better than features. Um, and now in regards to festivals, I found some amazing films at some of the underground, you know, hole in, hole in the wall film festivals, you know, and, 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 and it's created great relationships of going to those festivals because, you know, you never know. Sometimes a filmmaker, you know, might be wanting to release in their hometown at that film festival that, you know, was around the corner that they've been dreaming and going to since they were a little kid. There are certain film festivals, you know, not to name so many, but, you know, like um, Newport Beach Film Festival. You know, I've been going to Newport Beach for so many years and they create and, and get some amazing films at times, you know, um, their opening night films, their closing night films and some of the films through the festival. Same thing goes for like Dances with Films in Santa Barbara and, and you know, uh, Houston World Fest, just certain film festivals that I've been and I've attended that we found some, you know, some diamonds in the rough, so to speak, that you might not even see at a Sundance, you know, because this filmmaker maybe not even thought they had the opportunity of going to Sundance. So, you know, they just tried this film festival. Um, and, you know, so it, with that being said, you know, I've never looked at it in regards to, hey, you have to go to a prestigious film festival to find the best films. Now, of course, if you go to Sundance, you're going to see, you know, top echelon. If you go to Toronto, you're going to see some of the top echelon films. But there's so many out there. You know, I found so many great films at smaller festivals sometimes than I found at South by Southwest and, and some of the other big boys. So, you know, I don't think that. You know, I don't think the festival itself determines the type of film you're going to find. I think, you know, you just really have to kind of go through the film festivals and see what films are out there. Because, like I said, there's been some amazing films that, that have come, you know, from a Big Apple Film Festival that, you know, should have been in Sundance, you know, necessarily. But it just didn't go to Sundance, you know, and Big Apple happened to get it at that time. And, and it just did very, very well for that film festival. So, you know, with that being said, we try to cover as many festivals as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, definitely. We, we've screened films, like you mentioned, Dances with Films. We've screened films from theirs. We've screened films from Woodstock, San Diego, Austin. And yeah, I mean, it, we've had great turnouts and the, the audience loved them. And I mean, yeah, some great films coming out of these festivals. Um, uh, um, Ken, yeah. What about um, yourself uh, with some of the, I guess, smaller festivals? Um, do you seek out films from some of the, from some um, of the well? Mm, not as much you know i go to all the big film festivals mm -hmm. just because i gotta sell right. um and i think certain festivals like sundance and toronto have just become showcases for the big streamers and big studios like i, I don't go to sundance anymore i mean you if you're looking just for domestic u.s stuff you can find it but you're you know when when uh an amazon comes in and sweeps up coda for 25 million dollars it's just Forget about it, as they say. <laughs> you know, you just can't compete. And so I, um, I find that with little festivals, I, I'm selling a documentary right now called Rondo and Bob, which is a fun, Rondo was a 1940s actor called the Creeper. He had a disease, made his face look like he had elef elephantitis. And Bob is Robert A. Burns, who was the, um, the production artists on a lot of the great horror movies of the 80s, um, The Hills Have Eyes, um, you just go down the list, they were all, Bob Burns did all the production design on them, and the, their two lives intersected, The Creeper, Rondo, and Bob. Um, I've gotten um, U.S. interest, I just sold Germany and the U.K., um, so it is, it is um, selling, but it's got, what it has is, People who love horror movies know who Bob Burns are. They know who the creeper is, Rondo. They want to, they want to see this movie. So there, there's an audience for it. It has won 
so many horror film festivals here in the United States already, um, small ones, um, Atlanta, uh, Houston, it just, it just won an audience award at another one, I, I forget where it was, they've won about 10 audience awards, but they're all small festivals, and um, they, it, it did play Sitges, you know, if you've got a horror film, Sitges and uh, Brussels, which I've been to both festivals, are great if you got a horror film and you can find some interesting movies at, at those festivals. Um, so it, again, it's like everyone says, it's just dependent upon the film, but it's got to have some sort of audience built into it. You know, the, the, a, a reason to want to watch the documentary. Yeah, and this is, um, in, in, in regards to that, I just want to ask this one final question. Uh, th there was a question about how important it is to have your own personal audience when making a decision whether to distribute a film or not. So specifically, I'm just going to say, like social media, for example. Um, so Lev, as a distributor, w will you look at a filmmaker's uh, following on, say, Instagram bef in terms of making your decision? Of yeah, I mean, it's not number one. You know, it's not the first thing we're looking at. Um, it can't hurt to have a following. You know, I think when it comes to just general promotion, you know, we, um, for, for some of our smaller films, you know, we rely on our filmmakers to to handle, you know, if we're not running a formal ad campaign on a film, you know, we rely on the filmmakers to, to you know, blast it out to their audience, use their audience to promote to. Um, and, you know, you do a lot of the legwork to, to get, you know, the social answers that, that we'll provide, you know, to get, to get it out and to promote it. Um, so, you know, it, it's nice to have. It, it's definitely not a, a make or break. Yeah. Um, you know, we're more concerned with, you know, the, the cast's number, um, you know, or the director's number um, on, on social to see if, you know, they have a following, you know, if it's yeah. not necessarily a known cast member, but, you know, hey, they have 50,000 followers or something. That's, that's still pretty good. That, that's a decent audience to start with. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not a make or break, but it's, it's sort of nice to have. Right. Jeff, how about for you when you distribute a film? Do you look at social media numbers of the cast, the filmmakers, anything like that? You know, I found a lot of producers push that on me more than I actually get attracted to. You know, they, they always come to me, hey, this cast member has, you know, 100,000 plus followings on, on Instagram and this person, you know, super famous on TikTok and they have a million plus followers. And so I've learned that that doesn't necessarily turn and translate to numbers, you know, on the sales side, because we've seen it where, you know, hey, we're depending on this TikTok star and their million followers, but then you know, out of that million followers, what percentage of them are actually purchasing the film is, is the question. So, you know, I've always said a film is like a child at the end of the day. It has to kind of walk on its own after you kind of release it into the marketplace. So it helps that, you know, everyone has numbers that initially can promote that child too, right? But then they actually have to gravitate and like the child they're, they're looking at. Otherwise, they're not going to gravitate towards it. So I always say once a film hits the marketplace, it has to kind of walk and speak on its own. And so it helps to have some of those numbers in regards of initial attraction, initial attention, you know, someone to be aware now. So now if we're reaching out to a million plus people, hopefully the turnover is 2%, 5%, somewhere on those, along those lines. But at the end of the day, the film has to kind of speak on its own. And so I like it. It can help in regards to initial attention, but then I haven't seen it where it translates to dollars. All right. Thank you. All right. So... There, there are more questions, and I know people want to speak a bit about their films, but um, we are out of time. Uh, but I do want to ask each of you, is there a way that our participants can um, either get in touch with you or just maybe even your company website and send a message through the something like that? Um, I'll start with Lev. Is there um, any option there? Yeah, yeah, 1091pictures.com. Um, we have a little form submission uh, that, you know, goes, goes to a sort of hub of form submissions that we, we check daily and, and, and vet through. You know, we, we do take submissions and, and we'll review submissions um, of pictures. Uh, yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's probably the best way to, to get to us. Okay, cool. And they could write, uh, if they send through 1091pictures.com, they can say, um, you know, um, Big Apple Film Festival Conference, whatever, so you know. We're, okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, um, Jeff, is there a website or an email or something or a good way for anyone to get in touch with you or keep in touch? Oh, you're on mute, it's muted, yeah. Yes, of course. Well, my name is Jeff Porter. They can um, reach me at my company website, porterpictures.com, um, info at porterpictures.com, or if they're sending a, a film in or some kind of material submissions at porterpictures.com. 
Um, I also want to say what is a pleasure to, to speak on a panel with Ken and, and you as well, Lev. You guys are very knowledgeable, been in the business for so long, very impressed with your work and, and, and what you guys have accomplished. So definitely thank you guys both for, for, for helping and adding in and, 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 and being available to, this, to the filmmakers out here. You guys have been great. Cool. And uh, thank you, Ken. Ken, um, um, contact, uh, or is there a way to get touch? Yeah, I, put, I oh. just put my email address in the chat so people can contact me there. I see people uh, talking about TV series. I do TV series. I've got one that's in development at the CW now for summer 22 and uh, one at CW also for sale or IMDb TV for summer 23. So I am doing TV series just because I've got a lot of background there um, and I, I am developing things. And so I do take things, I do develop things right from sentence, cool. you know, to, all the way through. All right. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you all being here. Thank you to Lev, Jeff, and Ken. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time. Big Apple Film Festival is happening this week. Screenings at the AMC Empire in Times Square. Uh, at 11 o'clock, we have, an, which is in eight minutes, we have another panel on theatrical distribution. Um, so thank you all. Really appreciate your time. And I um, hope you all found this very informative. So thank you. And we'll see you all soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. you guys have a great, great morning. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> all right. How are you going? Thank you.